I'm Kelly Hogan. For those of you that don't know me, I have eaten only meat and animal products for the past 14 years with the addition of some seasonings and drinking some coffee. I stopped eating sugar and gluten, grains, potatoes, and yes, even all fruits and vegetables. 14 years ago, when my doctor told me that those foods were actually keeping me obese and causing me to be really inflamed. And for the past 14 years, my health has improved and I have thrived. Now, after we've done something for a really long time, it can be tempting to get set in our ways and think we have everything figured out. But 2023 has really taught me some big lessons. I made some big changes in my own eating, my own lifestyle, and I have some huge takeaways that I am convinced I will keep with me forever. These takeaways have not only helped me to feel better and they have helped some of my coaching clients to feel to get better results and to feel better, but I am currently, I think, the leanest that I have ever been on a carnivore diet. I am also eating more than ever and I have really good energy and deep sleep these days. So I wanted to pass along these takeaways and lessons to you too. So let's dig in, shall we? All right, I made this first change because of a conversation that I had with my friend, Sarah Kleiner. And it led me down a path of looking at studies on cortisol, and glucose, and morning routines. For most of my adult life, I would have coffee first thing in the morning because it was literally... I guess Folgers was right. It was the best part of waking up. And if you had asked me if that was hurting me in any way, I probably would have said, no, I'm doing great. But this year, around June, I started experimenting with postponing that morning coffee. Part of the reason why is I found out about cortisol levels being typically higher in the morning, which I kind of knew, and that that contributes to people having higher glucose first thing in the morning, that dawn phenomenon. And then I found out that, you know, dumping large amounts of caffeine on the issue only makes all of that worse. So cortisol just typically goes up higher and higher until I was finding that some of my group members would keep the dawn phenomenon until they finally ate lunch. So I finally decided to experiment with this and take Sarah's advice and simply postpone my coffee until later in the morning. So she suggested that if someone is going to drink coffee and she doesn't, okay, but I do, that they should eat some fat and protein first, uh, like some meat and eggs, and then get some morning sunlight into our eyeballs, our naked eyes. But when I heard that advice originally, I was not a breakfast eater, and I did not typically step outside first thing in the morning. So I started slowly incorporating a little bacon and a little eggs, even though I wasn't hungry, I wanted to give it a shot. After several months of this, I'm now eating three meals per day, every day, and I love it. I love it. I expected that my weight may go up a little bit by adding in breakfast and adding in more food, but actually the opposite has happened for me and for many of my group members. Many of us have found that we've actually lost body fat by waking up and trying to keep our get our cortisol to come down by avoiding blue light hello screens, and by postponing our coffee until we've seen the morning sunlight and until we have had a carnival breakfast. So after doing that every single day for many months, I really don't think I'm going to go back to my old ways. I don't see me going back to skipping breakfast and staring at my phone and chugging coffee first thing in the morning. Now, if you love fasting in the morning and you're getting great results, carry on, babes, right? If it works, it works. But if you're struggling, this one change could be helpful. My second takeaway of the year came from my friend, Susan Boykin. I was interviewing her about her phenomenal weight loss success story as a carnivore. And during the interview, she told me that she walks many miles each day and that she eats a very high calorie, zero carb carnivore diet. And that all got me intrigued. So I decided to start slowly increasing my food intake as I also started slowly increasing my steps per day. Now, at the time of that interview, I was taking about 8,000 steps per day, which I thought was pretty good. And it is. There's actually a lot of research to say that 8,000 steps per day is enough to give you a lot of health benefits, including about a half reduction in your risk of all causes of natural mortality. You can cut that by about 50%. But I thought... She is eating well over 3,000 calories per day. 
and she's walking way more than 8,000 steps. I just wanted to experiment to see what would happen if I also did both. So it turns out I love walking. The more I've walked, the more I wanted to walk. And I already knew I love to eat. That has always been true. I love to eat. So this became a really enjoyable experiment for me. Lots of walking and lots of eating. And after making those changes for the past several months, I am now eating 3,000 calories or more many days. And I am walking more than 20,000 steps many days of the week. How do I do that? Well, I reply to emails using voice to text. I take voice memos of my lessons while, while I'm walking. I take walks with my husband, with my children. I listen to podcasts and videos and take voice notes while I'm listening and while I'm walking. I pray out there. I think out there. I plan out there. Also, I have a walking pad because it's really cold. It's like a treadmill, but smaller. It fits underneath the couch. And I'm actually getting a lot of work done while I am also getting in all of these steps. And I'm eating far more overall. And yes, I'm also staying at a lower body fat percentage. It's all a total win in my book. So this year's takeaway, thanks to Susan Boykin, is fall in love with walking because it is amazing for fat loss and it keeps our metabolism so revved up that we can eat far more meat and still look and feel our very best. The third takeaway came from my friend, Dr. Ben Bickman. I interviewed Dr. Bickman after listening to many of his podcasts and videos on the topic of insulin. And his research taught me the importance of knowing our fasting insulin levels, as well as how to get them to an optimal level. And thanks to Dr. Bickman, I learned to focus on the five primary areas when I work with my coaching clients in order to help them to also get their insulin down. Those areas include avoiding sugary, high-carb foods that keep our glucose and insulin elevated, eating mostly fatty meats, which do not raise our insulin levels hardly at all when compared to any other food, Focus on movement, building muscle, walking, because muscle utilizes excess glucose and it keeps our insulin down. Managing stress because high cortisol levels compete with insulin and it actually makes us more insulin resistant and get better sleep at night because being sleep deprived very quickly makes us more insulin resistant and less sensitive to respond to our own insulin. And because of those conversations with Dr. Bickman, this year, I had my own fasting insulin checked, and I've had it checked actually a few different occasions, and I started really encouraging my group members to get theirs checked, and that's been life-changing for some of them because they have been able to watch their insulin levels come down throughout the past several months, and even though things on the surface may not be changing, for them to be able to see, oh my gosh, my insulin is coming down closer to optimal, which Dr. Bickman would love to see at a six or below. That has been a big encouragement to them to see the number come down and to see how it correlates with them feeling better and also watching the scale come down. And the rabbit hole of learning about insulin has also helped me to better understand why calories do matter more for some people, or I should say overall food intake seems to matter more for some people than for others, which I discussed in depth in my last video with my special guests, my dogs, Millie and Otis. My next 2023 takeaway came from a book that was actually written back in 1988 by Dr. Leonard Epstein, and it was called Traffic Light Diet. Now, this idea has been discussed by many people through the years, including my own good carnivore friend, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann, and others who don't even follow a carnivore diet at all. But I love this visual from Dr. Epstein's book. When I talk to my own group members, it seems to really resonate when it comes to talking about the carnivore diet. So the idea is this. As a carnivore, I have foods that Dr. Epstein would call green for go, which means I do not have to worry about moderating these foods. I don't lose my food peace with these foods. Um, I could just have them when I want them. And for me, those foods are Things like burger patties, chicken thighs, salmon, steak, pork chops. And there are certainly others. But we're talking about mostly fresh cuts of meat. I don't have to question things that are in this green category before I eat it. I don't have to sit and go, oh gosh, how is this going to make me feel? I know it's going to make me feel like a boss. 
I know that those foods are going to give me excellent satiety cues. They're going to get me in touch with my true hunger. They're going to make my body feel great. So no matter what time of day, if I find myself wanting plain burger patties, then I know I'm hungry. And if I eat them, I'm going to feel wonderful. They are green for go, as Dr. Epstein would say. On the opposite end of the spectrum are what Dr. Epstein would say are red for whoa. Stop, right? Whoa. And I don't touch those foods at all. I don't have mental discussions about it. If it's in the red zone for me, it's not up for debate. And for me, that includes anything with a sweet taste whatsoever, because that reignites my desire for sugar and carbs. Now, that may not be the case for you. Just because it's red for me doesn't mean something is red for everyone. But that's the reason I have never tried flavored electrolytes or flavored protein powders or even had one sip of diet soda in 14 years. Those things are in the red zone for me because they are sweet tasting and I don't want to lose my food piece. So I don't touch them. Also on my red zone is fiber because it gave me horrible digestion and IBS issues between constipation and upset stomach all the time. So I don't touch fiber. I don't touch wheat or soy because if I do, then I end up with leg cramps and anxiety like almost instantly. And since there are zero days of the week that I want leg cramps, anxiety, IBS, or sugar addiction, uh, those foods are in my red zone. I don't even contemplate having them. They're just off the table for me. Next, Dr. Epstein discusses the area between the yellow. Yellow for slow. So we've got green for go, yellow for slow, caution, right? And red for whoa. He says that in the yellow zone, there are just foods that we, we need to have maybe some rules around or at least be cautious of. And for me, even as a carnivore, I have those foods. For me, it's heavy cream, especially whipped heavy cream. Cheeses, oh, especially bread cheese. Bread cheese is just a block of cheese that you can fry and it gets crispy on the outside and it's ooey and gooey on the inside. And now it's in the yellow zone because it's just hard for me to moderate. I can overdo it. I don't know if I'm full. I don't know if... I'm satisfied. I just know I want more of it. And I know that the more I eat, the more I want, and the more I eat, the worse I feel. I just get acne, and I get a drippy nose, and I get kind of bloated, and I just don't feel my best when I eat it. Um, same is true for highly processed meats like sausages, most sausage, salamis and pepperonis, just cheese and deli meats in general. So I have parameters set up around those foods. So for example, if I'm at a holiday party, and I will allow myself to eat some cheese and pepperoni. And if I had some heavy whipped cream on an oopsie cake, which is just eggs and cream cheese with heavy cream, then if it's a special occasion, I will oftentimes allow myself to have it because it's in my yellow zone. I do not, however, keep oopsie cakes in my fridge at home or else I would be just mentally struggling all the time with, oh, is it time for more? Can I have more? Also, why is my nose dripping and my skin broken out all the time? So yes, that's the yellow zone. Foods that send me to a place of trying to moderate and knowing if I eat too much, I just feel icky. Um, so I use them sparingly and with caution and typically only for a special event. So I think this idea from Dr. Epstein of knowing exactly which foods work best for us and categorizing them as either green for go, yellow for slow, or red for woe is an amazing visual that is an old idea, but was brought to my attention again in 2023, and I'm really grateful. Great, I have two women to thank for this next takeaway and this next change that I made in 2023. It's Danny Conway and my friend Anna Maria. You may remember her from a video about how she has lost now, I think, 190 pounds, which is incredible. And Danny Conway is just an amazing wealth of knowledge. And I love hearing her talk about metabolic reset days. So we all know that our metabolisms tend to slow down when we're in a calorie deficit for a long time, or even when we're just losing weight. Our metabolism slows down. This is documented. If you didn't know it before, you know it now. And as our metabolism slows down, it gets harder and harder to lose more weight. And that's when people tend to get stalled and frustrated. Danny Conway and I discussed metabolic reset days and that whole process back in our video in January of this year and it got my wheels turning and I've used some of those techniques before but I had never heard it labeled and discussed quite like she did so thanks to her I started to consider it 
and research it and utilize it for myself. And then I interviewed Anna Maria this year and I heard about how she kept breaking her weight loss stalls to where she has now lost almost 200 pounds. And she talked about how she would throw in some sort of monkey wrench, unusual oddball days about twice per week just to keep her metabolism guessing. Oh, metabolic reset days. So then I started working with my own group members on how they can add metabolic reset days one or two times per week. And I gave them many examples of these kind of days. And I go through all of them really thoroughly each month with my members. We talk about things like a bone broth fast, uh, fat fasting, where you only eat fat for a day, high calorie days with no tracking. And honestly, there are pages more of those. But what I found is that if a person stays at a very slight calorie deficit most days of the week, but then they throw in one or two days of something different, then they are less likely to hit these long weight loss stalls and less likely to slow down their metabolism. So the results have been speaking for themselves with the people that I've worked with. And I'm just here to say metabolic reset days for the win. Next takeaway. This year, I talked to Coach Bronson, and he was so passionate when he talked about the need for building muscle and how we should focus on our actual body composition and our strength more than just the bathroom scale. He was so compelling when he talked about also that if we focus on the work that we are doing, that is the win instead of just looking at our, our overall body weight then we're going to win every time and we're going to end up with better results. That whole talk, it, it just struck a big note with me. So I purchased two body composition scales. One is the in-body scale and the other is the Vivitar scale. I, I like both of them very much and I'll link them both below. But I decided to start doing resistance training twice per week. I also had my very first DEXA scan done. I had that done just maybe a month ago. And throughout this year, as I was... Yes, stepping on an overall bathroom scale, and I was working on trying to build muscle mass. There were times when my overall weight did go up, but I was able to see that my body fat percentage was going down, and it correlated better. That number, my body fat percentage going down, correlated with what I was seeing in the mirror looking better, my clothes fitting better, how strong I was getting at the gym, and what the DEXA scan showed. So that data on body composition scales was just far more useful than relying on my overall body weight, which is what I was used to doing. And when I went for my DEXA scan, I did find that my visceral fat was crazy low, which I'm so thankful for. Uh, my overall body fat percentage was 15. Uh, again, that was about a month ago and I had it checked. And that correlated really nicely with both of the scales, the in-body scale and the Vivitar scale, what I was seeing at home. And it has been really helpful to see those numbers and to see muscle mass increase as body fat goes down and not let my overall weight trigger me mentally as that process was happening. So even if my overall weight goes up and down during those times, I don't think I'm ever going to look at a bathroom scale the same way again. So thank you, Coach Bronson. Okay, the next idea came from a podcast called Weight Loss Made Real with Cookie Rosenblum. It is not a carnivore podcast, but somebody sent it to me because they thought I would like it, and I did. And she talks about the idea of YOLO, you only live once, and how our voice of sabotage or addiction can say that to us. You should do it. You should have the sugar or the desserts, the treats, because you only live once. And it leads us to feel like we're missing out on something. It's the fear of missing out, right? The fear of missing out. And she said that instead of feeling like we have this fear of missing out, the FOMO and the YOLO, you only live once, there's a fear of missing out. She says, stop, let's replace it with JOMO, the joy of missing out. Well, she didn't expound on that too much, but it got my wheels turning. And I talked it out with my group that day, the very day that my group member sent it to me, we discussed it. And I got to thinking, let's relate it to Christmas, which... As I'm recording this, Christmas is coming up on Monday. When I go to holiday events next week, I will not be eating the desserts that other people are eating. And that could lead me to feel like oh, a fear of missing out. I'm missing out on something. 
<laughs> and I only live once. Now I'm going to miss out on these desserts. But I actually, at this point, feel very joyful that I'm going to be missing out on those things. I have JOMO, the joy of missing out. Uh, because now I am actually strong enough and confident enough to not give in and eat that junk. I, I'm going to miss out on the harmful foods that used to cause me a lot of pain. And I don't feel sad at all that I'm not going to be eating them. I actually feel really strong and confident at, because I have this ability now to just say no and pass it up. I'm like immune to it. And that doesn't make me sad at all. I actually feel really impressed with myself and proud of myself that I don't eat that stuff anymore. It brings me joy to know that I'm no longer a slave to those foods. And there's also joy in that freedom. And I have joy in knowing that I'm not just missing out on the junk foods. I'm also missing out on diabetes and joint pain, boils and obesity. I'm missing out on food addiction. And I don't miss any of that. So even though I have experienced this joy of missing out, I didn't really have a good way to label it. So I'm thankful to Cookie Rosenblum for giving me a way to describe this JOMO. And I also have another form of JOMO. It is the joy of meaty options. So I just take joy in all of the beautiful and delicious meat and animal products that there are while I'm also missing out on all of the pain and addiction that processed foods cost me. JOMO, baby. I feel like this video is getting really long because I'm long-winded, so I'm going to try to speed this up a little. All right, this next one, I actually heard it in 2022, but I leaned into it a little more in 2023, and that is the idea of anticipatory dopamine. So when somebody's having a craving for something that they know does not serve their body well, like, say, donuts, their dopamine levels start to rise in, in anticipation of getting the substance. So I've tried to teach my group members that when our dopamine is high, it puts us into seeking mode, right? And it's a big opportunity for addiction transference. And that is the process in which we go from being addicted to one substance or behavior to another one. And that sounds bad because frankly, it can't be. If we switch from say, a drug addiction to a sugar addiction or then to a shopping addiction or a porn addiction or a gambling addiction. We're just transferring it and there are no good options on that list in my opinion. However, when our dopamine is high because we want something, the donut, when we want it and it's not good for us, we know we don't want to do that thing, but in that moment we actually do something or eat something that really is good for us, it reinforces that behavior and we start to want to do that good thing more. So if the donut elevated dopamine for me, but while it is elevated, while I have dopamine in my brain, I eat some steak and take a walk. With the dopamine there, we are reinforcing that and it's going to cause us to want more of that, the steak and the walks. So whatever you do while your dopamine is elevated, you will likely want more and more of that. So please choose wisely. And I love that takeaway. Next, this year I started eating more fish. In fact, most every week I eat fish about twice per week, sometimes more. And I don't really have any one person to thank for that, but I did start seeing research about how higher omega-3 levels are strongly associated with lower inflammation and lower cortisol levels. And around the time I was reading all that, I met my group member named Marsha. She was doing carnivore, but she still had lots of joint pain and fibromyalgia pain, even after several months of doing carnivore. And we were both baffled and she was sort of frustrated because her husband was doing carnivore and he was getting these amazing results. She had cut out eggs and cut out dairy and she still just wasn't feeling like miraculously better. And then she started eating more fish. She didn't even like fish, but she decided to give it a go she felt something within her start to improve and she started eating more and more fish and that led her to a few months of what she deemed salmon palooza and marcia started to regain some mobility in her hands and in her feet she she felt less pain and then she began eating fish literally every single day 
And even though she had never really loved the taste of it before, she grew to love it. And her experience combined with the research that I had looked at convinced me and a lot of my other group, group members to start including more fish in our diet. And I don't see that changing for me anytime soon. So there you go. Those are some of my favorite changes that I made this year that I am going to take with me into 2024. Now, if you would like some help working on any of those topics, whether it's on how to lower your insulin levels, how to adjust your macros and calories, how to feel the JOMO instead of giving into addiction, um, utilizing that traffic light eating method of the green, yellow, and red, how to lower your cortisol levels, how to keep your metabolism revved up, how to utilize that anticipatory dopamine, how to improve your overall body composition. Well, I teach eight classes per week, and I would love to see you there. December classes, of course, are well underway and almost done. January classes are completely booked up, and February has just started enrollment. And I would love to work with you if you think I could be of help. Thank you for spending part of your 2023 with me, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Bye.